This is Bonnie Vent. I wanted to explain the abrupt ending on this video. The audience and I got a little carried away with the field research and other stories at the beginning. We exceeded the time on the memory card. The channeling session went on for over an hour, but only the beginning of the session was recorded. It does give you a taste of what the sessions are like and that they are indeed controlled by the audience. In this case, we also had an audible anomaly happen twice that was witnessed by three people in attendance. Be on the lookout for it in the footage. For more information, please go to bonnievent.com. If you're going to ask a personal question, a personal question about your life path, um, purpose-driven kind of questions, um, Things have been brought up in the past. Uh, I consider them to be universally thought to be true, uh, like the library uh, they refer to, where any and all knowledge is stored. Uh, so you can ask questions about how that works. Uh, we've gotten answers on that before. Um, things about their dimension. Uh, things they'd like to see in ours. Uh, one of the things that they talked about the last time we did a session was that the governments were all going to be breaking down. And certainly you can now see that, you know, playing out. And to not be upset by it. You know, that's the thing. The more knowledgeable you are of what's going on on the higher level, the better chance you remain calm and make good decisions and look for good opportunities as they present <coughs> as opposed to just being afraid. Uh, so they're um, those kind of questions. Um, got into a conversation with you about, you know, how, how did you get started? Because people usually want to know a little bit about that, and I keep it usually very brief, because when I go to sessions like this, it's like, let's get into the gym. <laughs> Uh, but uh, basically, to make the story very, very short, I always knew that I had abilities. Uh, I grew up in a household that was very argumentative and things like that, so I had trouble with the outside energy in my environment. So one of the things I used to do was stare in the candle flame. When I was, I don't know, six, seven years old? I don't know why my mother didn't think I was going to burn down the house. Uh, <laughs> But back then, it was actually popular to take wine bottles and drip the wax. Yeah. And so I would take my crayons, and I would put them in the flame and let them drip down, which put me in an alpha state. So I learned how to get into alpha very, very quickly at a very young age. Um, I did have a whole career in software development. Um, most of that's now gone to India. <laughs> so. Um, I did hit a crisis point in the latter part of 1986. I was working for a company here in San Diego, and some of you may remember that the shuttle crashed. And the company I worked for um, did work on the shuttle. And so I had been there for literally a day when the shuttle crashed. And NASA comes in, and they want all the paperwork, and I was head of IT. So immediately I was in this crisis kind of situation, it wasn't something that we caused, and you know. So, broke up from a long-standing relationship, and then the shuttle crashed. <laughs> and that just pretty much put me over the edge at that point. Uh, so I would sit in my office, just, you know, crying, 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 you know, couldn't control my emotions. And one day I'm sitting there and I had a pad of paper and pencil in front of me. And uh, all of a sudden, I hear this voice. It's like, just this little voice. It's like, you could make that pencil move if you stared at it long enough. And it's like, yeah, OK, fine, I'll play. <laughs> so I, it's like, move, move, move. Of course, it didn't. Then I hear this big, booming voice. That pencil would move a lot easier if you picked it up. <laughs> so, okay, I'll play again. So I pick up the pencil, and they start. And I have no drawing ability. What's I can do digital art, but I have no ability to draw. And they started drawing these pictures. 
And of course, me being very analytical, it's like, well, what does it mean? No idea. It was a picture of a lady's high-heeled shoe. Okay, what does this mean? And they drew a few other things. And finally, I said, you know what? I said, you guys are really frustrating me because I can't figure out what you're trying to say. And if you can draw shoes, then you can write words. Mm -hmm. So little did I know, took me into what's now referred to as automatic writing. So I started with automatic writing. Well, I'm very skeptical, so it's like, okay, you know, prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it again. So it's one very simple story. They're always very simple and very elegant. Uh, my, uh, my mother was getting ready to move from one house to another house, and I had been over at this house and told her, it's like, don't move in here. There's things wrong with it. She said, well, I've already put down the deposit. You know, what am I going to do? So I'm sitting in my office one day, and I pick up the pencil, and it writes yellow marble. I said, we're we talking about the toy, we're we talking about tile, what are we talking about? The toy. Okay, what about it? Your mother has one. Okay, can I pick up the phone and call her right now? It's like, no, she hasn't done it yet. <laughs> so I waited till the end of the day, and I go pick up my daughter, and I walk in and I say to my mom, it's like, does yellow marble mean anything to you? And she goes, oh, you mean this one? <laughs> she had taken that yellow marble out of a game called Aggravation, which I think is really funny because I told them how much they were aggravating me. There's four red, four yellow, four green, four blue. Two of the yellow ones had air pockets in them, and she knew that. But anyway, she reached into a little baggie, she took the yellow marble, she took it over to that house I told her not to get, and she put it on the counter in the kitchen, and it rolled, because the counter wasn't level, and she got out of the deal. Oh. So now, how, that's... How, that's why did you get out of the deal just because the counter wasn't level? Because I told her that there were defects in the, in the house. They hadn't disclosed that there were defects in the house. Oh. And so she got her deposit back because she, well, I obviously guess. this is a defective counter. Probably the whole house was... Yeah. They, well, yeah, you don't know what's going on with the foundation <laughs> or anything else. There's no reason for the counter not to be level. They're usually um, installed level, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I, I was doing um, automatic writing for a while. Then I, my mother found this ad for this psychic hotline thing. And this is back in the time when they were actually legit. This was like, <laughs> this is like in the late 80s. And so I go in for this interview for this psychic hotline. And so in order to pass, you had to do a reading for one of the psychics that was already working there and the boss who's going to hire you. So it's a little three-person thing. So I go in and I do, you know, setting up and he says, oh, he says, well, you can't do automatic writing. That's too slow. We charge, you know, it was even back then, it was $50 for 15 minutes on the phone. So he said, you can't do your writing. Can you work without it? And I said, well, I'm pretty much hearing the information before I'm writing it anyhow. So OK. So I dropped the automatic writing, and I just went in right into just, there it is. Um, and so it's grown and grown and grown. Um, I've had a lot of tests that have been done from the other side, um, where they would, um, I used to call it touch and go landings. Spirit people would come in. Can you hear me? Can you sense me? You know that, and then they'd leave, and it'd be you know five or six of them a night right before I was getting ready to go to sleep, and um, they would manipulate my arms and legs and all kinds of interesting things. Uh, later on, it, it was interesting because when I worked with my research partner, I was doing field research at some you know famous haunted locations here in San Diego. And we had always sat in a chair in front of the camera. And so you, that's what you're doing is, you know, as when you're channeling the information, you're just sitting there in the chair. Well, I got the opportunity to work with this local ghost hunter group, and they all had Sony Handicams. And so they were able to get up and walk around. 
So guess what? The spirit people did too. <laughs> they came directly through. There's videos on YouTube. You can actually look at it. It's really, really fascinating. They came directly through and um, you can almost sense they're trying to adjust to the fact that they were in a physical body again. And the gambler was really kind of funny because he was getting up in their faces. Not because, you know, he was like, oh, hey, you can actually feel me, sense me, you know, because the guy's going, oh my God, I'm freezing cold, you know, when I was, and so he gets like right in the face of the camera, which is really kind of funny. And the disconnect between time periods, because the gambler is from like the late 1800s, so he expects that all men are going to be packing a weapon, <laughs> right? Because that's how it was then. And so when he sees these cameras, he assumes there's some sort of weapon. And then the present day guys are going, no, no, we're not trying to hurt you, you know, because most people don't pack weapons now. <laughs> and so they're, the disconnect in the, in the time frames was a very interesting thing to observe. And uh, I did some work at the Hotel Del Coronado, which Dale in the back, he's a big, big fan <laughs> of the, the story of the beautiful stranger at the Hotel Del Coronado. Uh, and same thing, you'll pick up the personality of that spirit person when they're coming directly through you like that. And she's so Victorian in her manner and the way that she presents herself that you can tell it is not me at all. So why is she still hanging around there? <coughs> She's not anymore. She left? Uh, but she was because she was misidentified. She's not Kate Morgan. And that's a whole other long story all by itself. Um, she was misidentified and she was, uh, she came with a gentleman friend, well-to-do gentleman friend that she didn't know where he went because he left and he didn't come back. And so she was concerned about what happened to him and so it was keeping her and not knowing exactly the circumstances of her death. So we were able to take, um, I call it history, mystery, murder, and mayhem. We were able to use channeled information from her along with historical documents, coroner's inquest, the front desk register is still here over the local university, the actual original register. Uh, and we were able to piece it together and with the additional information that she presented. And then we wound up with a spirit person witness that filled in some more information. And she talked about a room that did exist in 1892 Hotel Del Coronado that does not exist today. And so we were able, we went, my research partner went to the Library of Congress, who lives in Virginia, went to the Library of Congress and pulled the drawings of the Hotel Dell from that time frame. And that room exists then, doesn't exist now. So what was the final, what had happened to him and... Oh, that's a very, very long story. <laughs> that could be a whole nother, a whole nother talk. Um, how do I shorten this down? Uh, she died on the steps. Most of the legend that you heard is completely wrong. Okay. Okay? So, Kate Morgan was a domestic working in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Missing persons case right around the same time as this person who died at the Hotel Del Coronado. Tom Morgan, her husband, in the legend is accused of murder, but in fact, Tom Morgan was a postal worker in Nebraska. Never been to California ever. His descendants are trying to clear his name out of this legend, but it's so ingrained in the marketing materials of the hotel that they won't change it. Even though they know that it's not correct, they won't change it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, the person who signed in, who signed, well, she was signed in by the front desk clerk, mm -hmm. okay? Because she was a single woman coming into the hotel. There again, you have to keep in mind the time frame. Women were not allowed to be by themselves. They were always supposed to be escorted. Otherwise, they assumed you were a prostitute. And they didn't allow that at the hotel, though. At least not publicly, yeah. anyway. <laughs> That's interesting, because that was etiquette I've discovered that was the etiquette that a single woman could not walk the grounds unescorted. Right. 
Right, and she, she actually talks about this because, well, there, maybe we should switch this. Yeah. We'll just go to channel. We'll just talk about the hotel down. So anyway, the, the, the person whose name is on the register is Lottie Bernard is what it says. It's actually Barnard from Detroit. And through Ancestry.com, we were actually able to locate a city, Detroit City Directory, with her name in it in 1890. Wow. Okay, so this whole thing about it, you know, she was under an assumed name, blah, blah, blah. No. She's exactly who she says she is. But the front desk uh, clerk misspelled her name, or it's hard to see because it's, you know, it's written in cursive. Her last name is wrong by one letter. Okay. okay, so we were able to actually locate her. And some things people take away from historical evidence because it doesn't fit the narrative. Because people wonder, well, why was she there? Especially if she's Kate Morgan, because Kate Morgan's a domestic. Why would a domestic be, you know, coming from Los Angeles, which took, you know, all day, literally all day, why would a domestic be staying at the hotel? Mm -hmm. Because it was a very fancy hotel back then, too. Mm -hmm. You know, any more than you wouldn't find someone, you know, of meager means checking in there now, because it's very expensive. And so it's very fine little details. In the newspaper accounts of the day, she would, you know, she was talking to everybody while she was at the hotel. And so she needed, um, she suffered from neuralgia, which is roughly like migraine headaches. And she actually showed me this. I mean, she had me experience it, you know, with the bright white light and stuff, you know, and, and just, your head just wants to. <clears throat> so it's like, okay, this, and it turned out to be important because Kate Morgan came to California, Los Angeles, because of rheumatism. It's a completely different thing. But they found the quinine in the room. Well, the quinine was for neuralgia, not because she was trying to abort a baby, which is part of the legend thing. Okay? So it's just wrong, 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 wrong. The coroner said that this woman, he examined the body of, that she had possibly given birth, which is interesting because she told us she was a widow and that she lost a child in, in childbirth. Okay, so there's where the whole aborting the baby part of the story comes from, completely wrong, <laughs> completely untrue. So the, her trunks that she kept asking about were left in San Diego because she actually came over by the um, ferry because mm -hmm. she had been on the train forever. That was the other thing too, the eyewitness, the guy that signed in right after her, he saw her on the train in Denver with this gentleman. So she can't be coming from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's just so much that, you know, and this is all historical fact, it's not speculation. And uh, so anyway, getting back to, <laughs> bring us back around. So this is the type of field research work that I do in correcting history and releasing <coughs> these people, not by saying, oh, go to the light, you know, because that, if they're there, they're there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so we assisted her in figuring out what happened. She actually was murdered. She didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, she took the burden on herself because she said, well, I wasn't supposed to be walking the grounds by myself, as Gail mentioned. She said that, so, and she just thought she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So she was sitting on the stairs, looking out at the water. Stairs aren't there anymore, sadly. And she hears a, a gunshot. And so she lifted up like that to see where it was coming from. And she got hit by the second shot. And the thing that was interesting was to watch her kind of unravel. Because if you've ever been through a major betrayal in your life, which pretty much everyone has, mm -hmm. She went through the same kind of thing because she's saying, oh, well, you know, I was just in the line of fire. It was an accident, you know, wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. And my research partner said to her, well, did you see who they were shooting at? 
No. Well, had it occurred to you, maybe they were shooting at you. <laughs> and she just got like this look on her face, and it's like, oh my God. All these things this guy told me that I was here for, blah, 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 blah. And it was all a lie. And so then she provided us with more information that the only thing she had of value for dress designs, and back then you couldn't buy ready-to-wear clothes. Mm -hmm. And she said that she did costume design for the theater. Well, when you look at the actual historical evidence, there was an invitation from two very prominent ladies in the theater found in the room. No one wants to, it doesn't fit anybody's narrative because they don't know how she fits into that. She was invited by prominent, you know, celebrities of the day to come to the hotel. Some people were supposed to be coming down from San Francisco to look at her dress designs to do the very first ever ready-to-wear fashion. And so a few years later, 1910, Tent City, which is where the Strand is now, Tent City had a uh, little local newspaper, and she had given us the man's last name. And here's that same name, very first ever in Coronado, ready to wear fashion. Wow. So to answer what happened to the guy, probably what I can tell you is, she said he had the claim checks for her trunks. The designs were in the trunks. The trunks were never picked up by law enforcement. There was a key in the, in the room. They went and checked to see if it unlocked the trunk. It did, and they left it there. They didn't put it into evidence. So after this whole misidentification thing happens, then all of a sudden the trunks disappear. Well, he picked them up because he had the claim checks. And there's no trace. Nobody remembers who picked them up. So odds are he was a man of wealth because that's, no one covers up for the average person. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, as far as I know, she's not there anymore. Uh, when we first met up with her, her biggest gripe was that she was uh, called by the wrong name. Her second biggest gripe was that every time something happened, she got blamed. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was kind of interesting. And then they ended to go to the light? Um, she went through an interesting, and a lot of this was through me, she went through an interesting um, progression where she started getting, um, for want of a way, better way of putting it, forgetful. Mm -hmm. So things that she had told us before, all of a sudden she was struggling trying to remember. And she had almost, almost like someone with Alzheimer's, how they know they're losing the memory and they're trying really, really hard to get it back and the frustration that goes along with that. And so we actually experienced her transitioning slowly as she was releasing what was keeping her stuck. Mm -hmm. And I have not um, sensed her there since. My first encounter with her, I was actually doing a photo shoot for San Diego Magazine, and I was out in front of the Hotel Dell. And it's funny if you look at the picture, because the cameraman goes, do that funny thing with your face again. <laughs> because it looks so spooky. Because she was actually standing behind the cameraman, and she was trying to get my attention. And it's like, leave me alone. I've got to get you. I haven't done a photo shoot before. Don't mess with me. And so that was my first encounter with her. And so we went back uh, later on to do more research on it. And I was surprised how far off that legend is. It's just amazing. But yeah, it's really very interesting work. And also tells you that people, not only do they survive um, death, but sometimes they you know, wind up with issues that they can't let go of. So, so I tell everybody, don't have any regrets. Because you don't want to be stuck for 120 years in one spot. Yeah. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> oh, Bonnie, did she mention how long 
it felt to her in time? Not, may not have been 120 years. She, she never did, but she did express a certain amount of frustration that other people had come into that room and had set up all this equipment and they were supposed to be there to help her and they just walked away. So she took it very, she didn't talk about time frame, but she took on the hurt feelings from present. <coughs> so she was very much aware of what was going on present day, which we found with Thomas Whaley too at Whaley House, very much aware of present day, uh, which is also a very fascinating thing. So when you talk about time, it gets very, uh, it's a very interesting question I can't answer as to how much time, because if you're aware of present, but then you're also stuck in this other time frame trying to work out whatever's going on back there, what does that time span feel like? Like a nightmare that never ends all bit. I don't know, it may be a blink of an eye. You know, that's what they say, is that life here is like a blink of an eye, so you know, why I keep running. I <laughs> you never know how much time you Don't have. <laughs> exactly. So, anything else on the on the history? I hadn't even intended to talk about that, but I always leave these things open ended because they always mean something to the people that attend. So, I, I didn't read the disclosure that we call the consent. That's what I was signing with. Um, is, it, it, is it okay to record your channeling or not, or just, no? Yeah, actually, um, I record everything that I channel because it turns out that a lot of times it's very meaningful later on. Like I say, I'm very much a prove-it person, mm -hmm. very into validation of information. So anything that gets said, you know, there again, when you work with uh, parapsychologists like I do, people that um, are really seriously researching this stuff. I'm not talking about the TV show Ghost Hunter people. Mm -hmm. But you know, people that are really researching it. Uh, the bar is very, very high. They want everything documented. And so I've been asked to, you know, please document everything that you do so that we can go back and look at it later if we need to. Um, there are some things that people have noticed, um, physical things that happen when I'm in channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, just interesting little things. Sometimes my eyes will modulate like that, mm -hmm. which that can't ha you can't make that happen mm -hmm. unless you have an illness, in which case it happens all the time. Well, actually, I, I went to high school with a kid who could do it. He used to freak people out and look at you and go. <laughs> <laughs> so. Clearly, some people can do it. Okay. Yeah, it's um, not a common thing, though. And my eyes will dilate really, really large. And as you can tell, I'm not under influence of anything. <coughs> it's a little water. That's it. Um, so there, there are sometimes physical things that they will see and observe and say, "Oh, well, that's interesting." And, you know, um, we do talk about sometimes the mechanics of it because that's what I wanted to know. It's like, how does this work? How are you able to come through me and come out with information? And the way they explained it to me is that they use my brain capacity, whatever language I have, whatever knowledge I have, they have that at their disposal. So they can pick and choose out of the things it within that and try and come up with the right words for what they're trying to convey. So they will use my vocabulary to, I mean, individual words to come out with what they want to say. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That's so, interesting. That's really interesting. So you wouldn't spontaneously start speaking Chinese if you didn't already know Chinese? Yeah or whatever language they speak. Right. Yeah. And a lot of things are very difficult to put into words, and they do their best to try and give exam real-world examples, but the real-world examples are coming from the channel. So do they have, um, do you know where they, where they lived, what time frame they're from? Or is it, is, that doesn't matter, it's just a group of people, a group of souls, or? Uh, I. 
I don't see any evidence that they've ever lived a life individually. Uh, there again, it's all very, we like to put labels on things, it's very arbitrary to them, they make that very, very clear. When we talk about the number of dimensions, it's like, yeah, well, sorry, they don't have numbers, you know, it just is, it doesn't work that way. But we understand that you need those in order to navigate, so we'll try and talk to you in, in the way that you can understand, but also be aware that those levels don't actually exist in that fashion. <laughs> so, the, how did they assemble as a group? The visual that they give me, which there again, they're giving it to me because it's something that's comfortable for me. That's my feeling, okay? I'm a business person, so the way they present to me is like a group around a big conference table. And they're like a panel of experts all coming together. And the other thing too, my, uh, my former research partner was an audio engineer. So they were talking to him about this. Because there's, how do you get a group all coming out in one voice? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you're an audio engineer. You know about multiple channels all going outbound one channel. And so it is truly a collective that is getting processed. I have no idea how this is done on because they can accept multiple inputs all at one time where they are. We don't handle that. So they're trying to condense it down into one single channel coming out through me with my voice to convey information. Why do they do it? Their purpose, um, and we got very, very close, uh, they want to build a bridge between what go is going on with them and our scientific community. And I got very, very close, I can't say who, <laughs> but I got very, very close to getting to the university level. The problem with, with that is funding, because they only fund certain things. And this isn't it. Uh, so you've got, you know, funding for a spirit phone with, you know, Dr. Gary Schwartz, for instance, mm -hmm. um, when, you know, you really could spend the money on, gee, what's going on in our environment because there's so, our, what we are able to see and perceive is so narrow as compared to what's really there. Well, why don't they channel it through Bill Gates, somebody who has, already has the money? I mean, it, it just seems like that would be an easier way to go than to... to yeah, but Bill it. Gates would want to be able to do that, and he probably doesn't, right? They don't want Microsoft to anything to do with it. <laughs> no, well, well, it doesn't have to be Bill Gates. I just use that as an example. No, I, I'm saying, though, whoever they choose has to be willing to, to do this. And it's still very taboo. Mm -hmm. You put up with a lot of crap when well, you do this. Well, there are crazies around that have lots of money, like you know Howard Hughes did. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I'm being yeah. serious. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, and there were people. And he talked to people. You know, he talked to spirit, and they said he was an eccentric, crazy, rich old man. No one and paid any attention to him. Yeah. Well, there were other things he did, supposedly did that were kind of nuts, anyway. So. <laughs> So their purpose is to... Well, I, don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll give you another one that's kind of the same thing. Why didn't they go to that person? And I don't know the answer to this, but I'll just throw it out there. When um, Crocodile Hunter Steve Irwin passed away, he came to me and he said, I need you to get this message to my wife. And I have these documents in this file cabinet. It's all about what to do in the event of my death, and I really need this information to get to her. Well, I'm sitting here in San Diego. You know, he lives in Australia. And it's like, how the heck am I going to do that? I was talking a little bit before about connecting the dots, because what I've no noticed in the work that I do is that I don't get given that task unless I'm actually able to complete it. Even if I don't know how, I'm going to complete it. But there again, that takes dedication on my part. Most people doing this work work with customers coming in, paying for a reading. 
So you're going to give that information to whoever paid the money for the reading. This is coming in from the spirit person saying, I need to get this information. Nobody's gonna. Nobody's paying you. <laughs> you gotta go find that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things I, I started doing is I'm also a talent broker, and Butch Patrick was one of my clients, Eddie Munster from the Munsters. So he was doing an event in Chicago. So I set this thing aside and I said, okay, I got to do this whole promotion thing for him. So I go to this Yahoo group that I formed, and it's like, you know, Butch Patrick's gonna be blah 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 blah. And I immediately get a response back. It's like, oh, I would love to go see that, but we're all mourning Steve Irwin's death. He was my uh, high school friend. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It's like, seriously? Yeah. And so come to find out, this guy's he's a truck driver. He's an Aussie truck driver. He doesn't know anything about what I do or care or ever thought about it. But, you know, it's like, okay, here's, and I type it out, and I do use Bill Gates, I use Microsoft Word to type out all my stuff. So I sent everything, I sent him the information. And he said, you know, I don't know, he said, but I'm on my way to Terry Irwin's house. And so he said, I, he said I'll print it out and I'll take it. Cool. Mm -hmm. So he did, he printed it out and he took it to her. Well, the problem is, she's distraught, so she doesn't remember getting it, so he has to follow up, and so he contacts the, their zoo in Australia and says, you know, just wanted to make sure she got it, and you know, so he gets this letter back from them, it's like, oh yeah, we found it in the file cabinet right where you said it was, and it was because of her having access to those documents that she turned down the state funeral because he warranted one because she knew exactly what he wanted. Now, when you do a little bit of research on it after the fact, because he interviewed Terry Irwin many, many times after he died, and you find out that he always knew he was going to die young, and he used to mention it to her from time to time. And it's like, you know, you're being all gloom and doom. I don't want to talk about it. Which, you know, because he was a risk taker. You would expect him to have documents what to do in the event of his death, even though he's only 40-something years old. But for his wife not to know, well, she didn't know because she didn't want to know. And that's a personal thing between the two of them, which is why he's scrambling saying, oh, she needs to know where this stuff is. Okay? So later on, getting back into why didn't they go to fill in the blank. Because the one year anniversary, Terry Irwin hooks up with John Edward. You guys all know who John Edward is, right? Mm -hmm. Supposedly was a friend of Steve Irwin's. They sell tickets to have Steve Irwin come forward at the Crocosseum for this big event. So I got a hold of John Edward's office because I had you know, talked with them before and I said, look, this is awful. You know, this is just really awful. Don't please don't do this. Well, nobody listened to me, so they went ahead. But Steve Irwin came back and he said, "If anyone tells you that I talked to John Edward, you tell them they're full of shit, because <laughs> I'm not going to talk to him." And he didn't. But if he was friends with John Edward, why didn't, and John Edward's famous, John Edward can pick up the phone and do whatever. Why didn't Steve Irwin talk to John Edward? He went through me because I had a contact with a family friend that he trusted. Or he, he, what do you call it, manipulated so that the friend contacted you because that was after the fact, right? After you received that from Well, the, the friend family. happened to be in a group, in a Butch Patrick fan group. And, but did you know that at the time? No. See the message that point. It so seems, he orchestrated, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's all about connection points. So yeah, I was put into a position where we could actually get that information delivered, and we did deliver it. But I didn't get a thank you from anybody. It's like yeah, we got it. Thank you. <laughs> no, it seems it seems like intent is kind of important here. Yeah. And not just. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, you know, some things have taken me years. Um, the first celebrity that came through was John Ritter. And he wanted to get a message to somebody who I'm not allowed to name. 
and I moved heaven and earth. I mean, I actually went up and was at a taping of Eight Simple Rules because he gave up on the first person and then decided to go with another one and told me, here's what I need you to send to them and you need to go up there and hand deliver it. And so I was going up to Los Angeles and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, and got told, you know, don't ever talk about it. But that was, that was the very first one. The information was all validated. Um, and the most famous was Michael Jackson, and he died. And that's oh. a whole other long story. So how do you, con do you control your trance thing? Uh, I mean, how does it, you were talking about looking at a, a flame, a candle flame, but it, can you now just go, oh, here, get into this and, and just Well, when, when, these, uh, when these spirit people come in that are, you know, when they're asking for assistance, Usually it'll be triggered by something that I see, like so-and-so just passed, and then all of a sudden they'll be boom, right there. So I have to have a certain awareness, a little tiny bit of awareness, that they've passed, which seems to set up the connection point. But if you're sitting here now, and they don't really have anything to tell you about anything, and nobody's died except maybe Susan's mom, I mean, you know, that's a significance. But, but so well, how so do you get into it? So that's different than what the connection does. We've gone like, we've done like, we talked about everything except what the connection does actually. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the field research work, there again, spirit people coming through asking for assistance. The celebrities, same kind of thing. Spirit people coming through asking for assistance. Some more notable than others, but most have had a certain amount of notoriety to them, which is interesting. Um, maybe to keep me interested, I don't know. Uh, the, the connection, uh, I can just, it takes me a second. I, I purposely put together a, a two second, a two, two minute uh, little music thing to kind of get us all in the mood. Because it will take maybe 30 seconds to a minute from the time I set my intention to go into trance before they will come through. Um, and they will come through and greet you and, you know, and then you're open to ask your, your questions. Uh, but you're not talking to an individual spirit person. You're not talking to somebody's mom or, you know, anything like that. We're you're, in the boardroom? Yeah. 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 yeah you're, you're talking to the boardroom. Bonnie, what's the protocol for question asking the board? Whether they go from person to person or... It doesn't matter if you're if you feel um, there again. I was everything I go by by feeling. So uh, when I've done this before, there hasn't been people that have at, tried to talk at the same time. Usually, there's just a little pause, and then somebody will pop in with with the next question. Maybe we can change that. <laughs> <laughs> you're such a trouble. Uh, thank you. I, I asked earlier about They will wait very patiently. They're, I mean, they are the most patient ever. Is it okay to record, like, on my phone so I can listen to it later? Sure. Yeah, you can record if you want. Sure. All right. um, most likely, uh, this will wind up on YouTube later okay. as well. Because, um, you know, I, I like to share as much information as I can. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see, you know, the groups get bigger and, you know, things, things grow also. Because yeah. um, I've, I've been doing so much in so many different areas that the people that are um, very interested in mediumship and things like that didn't seem to know me, certainly not locally, uh, because I've been doing a lot of work on the, on the national level. Uh -huh. um, but you need local support systems if you're going to do this type of of work as well. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of condensed it down so I can pretty much do everything myself because mm -hmm. I don't want anything to get in the way. And so the best I can do is to, you know, do this, make sure I capture it, and then put it out on YouTube so that people can look at it. And I do have a YouTube channel with a lot of channel stuff on it. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, I have a group on Facebook and every once in a while we do a, um, they will ask questions and I will get the answers and put them into a, a YouTube video out that way as well. Do you dream about them? 
The connection? Yeah. No. Uh -uh. So it's strictly business. No, I mean that. In a, I mean that, you know, like in a... Yeah. It's not like you it's think, oh, yeah, it's not like I'm, I, you know, you would think about, oh, i got to ask them this, or think about, have a dream about something coming through them. I'm just wondering how connected the connection is to you. Um, boy, they've been with me for a really long time. Um, I used to have just one guide who identified himself by the name of Michael. And I would see him once in a while. Um, my daughter would see him too, which was kind of funny. <laughs> we were walking in uh, one night, my daughter and I. She was, I don't know, like 10, something like that. And the front door, and then there's a long hallway, and my bedroom was at the back. And everything was dark as I was opening the door, and I could feel that energy. It's like, oh, something, something's present. And my dog had been on my bed, and she came running down the hallway. She ran right through my spirit guide, who was there with some other guy, who I don't know. There were two of them at the end of the hallway, and the dog ran right through. My daughter looked, we didn't say a word, my daughter looked at me and I looked at her and we both went, ew, <laughs> at the same time, so I know she saw it too. Uh, so I used to have just the one um, guide that I was aware of. And then he went away for a long time. And so I was asking, it's like, okay, well what happened to my guides? Because all of a sudden I, I seemed to have nothing, you know, which is not the nicest of feelings. And so then they said, oh, well, you know, you have graduated, which I thought was an interesting term. You have graduated, so we're now taking you up to this level. You said they. Was they the collective that? Yeah, the, yeah. the, the connection came the through. Yeah, they the came through and they said, you know, this is who we are. You know, gave me the visual. This is who we are. This is what we're about. We want to build a bridge between where we are and where you are. Because um, basically, the way they put it, I said, you can't say that. Because they said a lot of people are going to be exiting all at one time. Mm -hmm. And so you need to not be afraid of the transition process. So many people are afraid of death. We need you not to be afraid. And so that seems to be the core mission is to provide information so that people are a little bit more comfortable about what's going to happen after they leave here. Cool. How many people in, uh, say, in this country do what you do? Because, you know, you're, I've known you see other people that will have on YouTube or you can see other people on the uh, Internet or mm -hmm. uh, some even TV shows have been done on it. But it's not like there's thousands out there. No, it's... Um, what I was told, and there again, I have no idea, you know, my research partner said that of people that trans-channel, which is not very many, only 1% do question and answer. Most do just, they just talk to you. They give you lessons or they are trying to teach you something. Um, whereas the connection seems to take the tack of you are, have already learned a lot, you've already been on a spiritual path, so how can we help you? How can we be of assistance to you? Cool. So when they say build a bridge from where they are, where is it they are? Well, supposedly they are over in this other dimension that lays right next to ours. They don't identify themselves as coming from any planet or star no. system mm -hmm. or anything. Okay. No. And it's, it's interesting because um, anybody familiar with Kryon? Yeah, because initially um, when Lee Carroll was channeling Cryon, there was something said about them being on a, a spaceship, you know, out Cryon of Magnetic Service. And he took so much crap for that, <laughs> you know, the whole alien thing. Uh, so even if that were the case, I don't know that they would say it. But they've never said anything about being, and, and there are people that do channel what they consider to be, you know, uh, yeah, like the alien races, the, the dark star, the stars in the moon. Have you so, heard of him, the mm -hmm. through, um, oh, I have, yeah, Daryl yeah. Anka, from the SSI. 
So do they do they talk to you every day? I mean, do, do they just pop in? Pop in for a visit? They just, yeah, they just, you know, people just kind of pop in, you know, I'm kind of on all the time, but not in a way that's annoying. You'll hear other people talk about, oh, I can't shut it off, and, you know. Um, I mean, do they help you? If you're at a store and you're looking for something on sale, I mean, I'm not tr trying to be funny here, but... No, actually, I have, a, I have a really good example of that. Um, and I'm pretty sure that I manifested this thing. <laughs> something really simple. Time to put up Christmas lights, right? So I was looking for little cup hooks so I could hang the Christmas lights. So I go into Walmart, and they just, they don't have any, and I'm going through everything. They got all these different, I just want the little ones. It's like, oh, come on, you guys, I really need these, and this is, you know, such a small thing. All I need is those little cup hooks, and I can go through <laughs> my lights. And I turned away to look at something else, and I looked back, yeah. and here the package of cup hooks was right there. Mm -hmm. That's and they, pretty cool. And, and it was not there before. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah, little, yeah, little things like that can happen. I mean, they're, they're rare, but that one happened recently. Uh, but there again, I don't actively try, you know, some of the burdens on us, I don't actively try to manifest all day long, you know. I have a very busy mind, I'm on the computer all day, you know, working with celebrity clients, trying to book them for <laughs> talent shows and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm not, you know, sitting, you know, meditating, and I can't meditate anymore. I can do guided meditation, but I can't sit and, and do meditation. Because there's just too much to do. There's just too much going on. Bonnie, will it take scientific questions along with philosophical? I would give it a shot. Okay. You know, I I have you know, I don't put any limitations on it. Once I get you know, once I get in channel, then it's up to them. But, you know, they're not necessarily all-knowing, but they definitely have a higher level perspective. What, are they more like in a priest or a metaphysical, or are they actual uh, scientists? Or, or Those are mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, they, they do get into um, some things, like, you know, talking about the library and how it works, and talking about... Um, music and tones and frequencies and things like that. Um, they are trying to relate to the average person, so they're not going to be super technical, I wouldn't think. Uh, but I don't know. You know, everything depends upon you guys. Everything depends upon the questions that, that get asked. But they're using your brain. So if you know the stuff, we should, right? But even if she doesn't know about quantum physics, she knows of quantum physics, so she yeah. might have and the it's, language. Yeah, it's the it. words. They're, yeah. trying, they're using the words, not necessarily my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're using my words. Well, your word, though, in your brain is associated with a concept, right? Potentially. Yes, potentially. Potentially. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's, cool. it's actually been interesting to see some of the work that's coming out from quantum physics and quantum mechanics and how it explains why what I do is possible. So I tend to look at it as a validation, not yeah. as a yeah. subject to study, but as, oh, hey, that's cool. You know, now the scientists are starting to come my direction. Mm -hmm. Good, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Is, is there any effort or, that you've been experienced to or you experienced, and I think you said it in a small way, where they asked you to send some information to Australia, mm -hmm. um, that actually caused something physical to happen in this existence, and actually uh, it was kind of a lot of stepping stone, but somehow it got through. Does that happen a lot? In other words, I'm going to look at, say, the, the world situation and how wars start and such, because people are influenced to do one thing one way or another thing. And uh, so some of the things that I wonder with is, like, we just went through a horrendous um, voting uh, election, which came out completely opposite, which many people thought. Is there a hand that was maybe invisible 
putting in that situation where it caused things to happen that you might say was guidance from another side or do they interfere with what we do, I guess? Or do they watch over us so we don't? Yeah, that's that's a tough one because that's like a, a wave of influence. Yeah. You're suggesting like a wave of influence from yeah. on high determined um, overriding maybe what people's wants and desires are. Is that well, in a way, you, taking precedent? you are able to... Because that whole thing is so manipulated on the human level that it's really that's, hard to, you know... Yeah. <laughs> it's, really, it's really hard to... But most yeah. of the human level didn't think what happened and what did happen. And that's where I'm wondering, about, is this some other extraneous influences that, you know, could have been in the same way that allowed your letter to get to Australia? Well, one, one wave that I noticed was a truth wave. A what? A truth. Okay. Wave. All right. So if you were lying, you tended to get caught. Oh. And that's on all sides. I'm not trying to be political here. Yeah. Just saying as far as a, a wave from on high. Yeah. Because we have been kind of in a, you know, the more you lie, cheat, and steal, and make it to the top, good for you. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is shifting on a higher level. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of, kind of, sort of. That's cool. So, yeah, I, for those that have high integrity and are tired of getting screwed over for it, it's like, woohoo! <laughs> oh, glad to hear that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, you feel like a schmuck. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah, I play it straight, I don't screw around with people, and, you know, and I wind yeah. up, you know, on the fuzzy end of the lollipop, so. So yeah, I, I think that's a, a very positive good thing. Um, now the connection has talked about the fact that the governments are gonna be breaking down, and so what what we do and how we function and, and how things happen in the world is gonna be shifting and changing. That doesn't really have very much to do with who got elected as president, by the way. Um, so those are the kind of things to look for, is what opportunities might present themselves that were not opportunities before. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can smoke pot now. Some places. How long will the channeling usually last? Half an hour? Um, yeah, no, no more than 45, I think. Is the camera running now? Yeah, the camera's been running. Oh, so I didn't know. I hope. I think I'm gonna yeah, record it for posterity. Yeah, sadly, we're probably gonna wind up with it shutting off before the channel. Oh, is do open. you want to turn it off now for a few minutes? Or does it matter? How long does it run? Um, I think I think the battery is good for like two hours. So uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah. I think you're still good then. If you want to peek over on the screen, it'll probably tell you how many minutes are left on the card. That was me you were directing that, right? <laughs> it's at 58, 52, 53, 54. So you got an hour and a minute. So that'll take care of the 45. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't in front of it. It's funny, it keeps making little noises when your camera was made a little... Did you hear it? Oh, twice. There was a voice that came through. Yeah, there was a voice that came through twice when you went by the table. Oh. Did you, did you yeah, hear it? Yeah, I heard it. Maybe it's my it's, it sounded like a female voice. Yeah, yeah. I did. What did it say? A high -pitched, it was a high-pitched little fe uh, female yeah. voice. Oh. Interesting. Oh. Dale heard it. I heard it. Did you hear it? Did you? Yeah. Well, I've been getting real chills when you've said certain things. You get this huge energy, and I'm thinking, wow, ooh, that's pretty cool. Are you from San Diego? You live here? I was born here. Wow. You're a rare yeah. breed. <clears throat> Not only was I born here, I had a past life here. Oh. And I was actually able to find myself in history. That's a whole other story. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? Maybe I need to do a whole talk about my other stuff and not channel. <laughs> do you remember any of your past life? Um, I did actually. Um, I did a. Uh, 
I don't know why I did this, but I decided I wanted to do a past life regression, just give me the endings. So I went through starting you know, back, and the life just before this one, uh, I died when a wall came over on top of me and crushed me. So I was laying underneath the wall and having trouble breathing and my legs were crushed, and that's where I died. Come to find out, I died in the 1906 earthquake was in San Francisco. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting because coming into, you know how they say people carry things over from one life to the other? Mm -hmm. Coming into this life, I was born with club feet, so both of my feet were, and I had trouble breathing. Wow. Hmm. So, well, will the connection address past lives? You can ask them whatever you want to ask them. <laughs> just just realize that they're looking like a bird's eye view. So think of yourself in an airplane looking down at all the little ant cars. <laughs> I mean, if there's any karmatic uh, things that are affecting you this life that might be connected. I would just ask. I would just ask them whatever you want. Okay. If um, if they. I've never known them not to answer. Sometimes they'll sidestep it. <laughs> and usually that's because you need to figure it out yourself kind of thing. It's usually for, you know, because everything is to the best and highest good. So they don't want you to um, use this as a way to cheat on your life or shortcut or whatever. Um, but they do want to um, assist. So if something is concerning you to where it's preventing you from moving forward, or they can remove a block or something like that. Um, well, you know about block removal. We've done some of that. Dale? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so they will assist with, with those kind of things. And, you know, like I say, just go ahead and ask. So, okay, is everybody settled? So I was going to give us a little bit of music. Greetings and welcome to all that attend. We have been observing your conversation. We do find it quite lively. The energy transmitted in the room is tremendous. We hope that you are all sensing this. We are so happy to have the opportunity to come in and to communicate with you at this time or any time that this is observed as we are aware that others can see this in a different space and time. We would be happy to entertain your questions and we are aware that you have many. So we only ask that you speak one at a time so that we can process the information and come back through to you. Is this understood? Yes. 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 So whoever would like to be the brave one and to go first, you are more than welcome. The session is now open for any and all questions that you may like to ask. How can I help the baby? We are not sensing a difficulty with a baby. Would you like to be more specific? How can I be sure that the baby will be safe?
perhaps the reason why we are not sensing a difficulty is that there is a perception of unsafety that is not actually present. Is this more of a concern or has there actually been a safety issue? Thank you. You just answered my question. I would like to know how we can be of service during the tumultuous times ahead of us in our country. There is no doubt that major shifts are occurring. We would like to suggest to you that these shifts be handled as a positive and to refrain from feelings of fear to the best of your ability. We do not expect all people to adapt well to change. So there could be some circumstances that you will observe in your environment. The task for you is to handle that circumstance appropriately within yourself. This requires practice with balance and keeping, as they say, your wits about you in a perceived crisis. We do emphasize the word perceived because truly your perception of the circumstances can and will affect the outcome. Thank you. Will I be able to see and talk with my sister before she makes her transition? We understand your concern, but truly there is no concern. You will be able to stay in communication after transition has occurred. It does take some practice, more in observation than anything else, to notice small signs of communication and to continue to talk with her as if she were there in the room with you. So do not be concerned if you miss that particular moment. It is not that critical, but we understand that you would like to be able to be there. It's really a matter of shifting your focus and a little bit of manifestation work on making circumstances fit so that you will be able to do that. You're trying to synchronize with a particular moment in time, so do not feel badly if you miss the moment. We hope you understand. Yes, thank you. Earlier, a large transition of souls all at once, or I guess a lot of deaths are going to happen all at once. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how that's going to happen, or when that might happen, why it might happen, how that's going to come from? You have already been observing that over the past several years. They may, but are not always, natural disasters. We hope that you understand that there is technology involved with this particular issue. There are groups that are actively wanting less people to be here. There are also others who have come in before the shift that may decide that they want to transition early and come back later after all the dust has settled. This is their choice and they will be coming back. 
So there will not be, from our perspective, a life <coughs> lost. Is now a good time to start a business? In many ways it is. As old ways of doing things collapse, new ways will come forward. In some cases, the new ways will be old ways if you understand what I'm saying. Working with the land and being out in nature and being able to sustain yourself is key to this new wave. The existing monetary system and the way a human being uses money to get through their life will be challenged and will be changed and new systems will need to be created. There will be plenty of opportunities, especially for those that are not afraid. And that is part of our purpose for being here is to tell you that you are sustained by the universe and by nature. And as these economic systems fall away and new ones get generated, there is going to be a time of transition that may not be that pleasant for many. And so it's a matter of keeping your perspective, looking for opportunities. Certainly for now, with the existence of things such as the internet, it is much easier to get started for very little money. We suggest that you pick a passion, a very strong passion, something that you would do even if you were not paid to do it, and focus your energies on the most positive, well-intended, well-meaning, productive for society types of products and services that you can imagine. And do not let anything get in your way. If you have to do it alone, do it alone. It's fine. I would like to ask the question based on something you just said about as the old ways begin to crumble and change, specifically the monetary system. Uh, my question is, can we look forward to a more equitable use of the world's resources in the way um, that some forward-thinking individuals like Jacques Fresco and Peter Joseph have suggested a resource-based economy? There are certainly potentials. It's really going to depend on everyone's individual intent and getting into like-minded groups. But yes, certainly there have been great inventors in your not-so-distant past that provided such as free energy and their patents were hidden, for want of a better way of putting it or not in the public eye, so that people were not told or not given access to these brilliant ideas. The main reason being that they did not generate money. May I ask a personal question? It was a question about my life plan and combination. What location would be better for me to accomplish this life plan in the near future?
this may seem like a strange answer because you might think we would tell you to go out into the wilderness. But in fact, the services are going to be needed in local cities and towns. It doesn't really matter where you start. So we suggest that you start roughly where you are if you want to move due to concerns about weather or finances or things like that, that's fine. But the services that you can provide can be done anywhere. You do not need to be in the wilderness. As a matter of fact, the services are much more needed for people that do not have the ability to grow their own food for instance, or to make sure that the water is clean. So as the monetary systems fall and governments fall, so do the services that we take for granted. And there's tremendous opportunity in picking up on those types of tasks. And now is definitely the time to start. I know that maybe you don't perceive time as we do here, but what sort of Earth time frame are we looking at for those collapse to happen and governments to fall off? It's already started to happen. There are powerful people that are doing everything they can to prevent this from occurring. And you're going to see, as we mentioned earlier about a truth wave, you're going to see some very dark, ugly things come to the surface as it works its way out. So we are not suggesting that it's going to be sweetness and light but we are suggesting that you not be afraid of what you see and to realize that it is actually going away and dying a death. It's not necessarily going to go away quietly. Why am I stuck? That is a very interesting statement to make because the statement that you make proves your stuckness. Would you like us to clarify? Yes, please. The words being spoken, I am stuck turn that into an intent to be stuck. Perhaps the words to say differently would be, what opportunity is coming next? What opportunity is coming next? <laughs> of course, we're going to say, what opportunity would you like to see? Very much uh, you are in control more than ever of your own forward movement. This is a good thing and perhaps for some a scary thing, as in be careful what you wish for. But please don't wish for stuck because you will receive stuck. <laughs> So we suggest that you wish for something that you would like to see happen and to focus energy in that direction. Thank you. I had a question concerning the research at CERN. Is it really to open a portal to another dimension? What they are doing there is certainly playing with fire. You are correct to sense that there is 
a hidden agenda along with what the public is being told. So they are indeed working with Portal Energies.